wonderful. A new Australian film is now on release in cinemas across Australia, a film called Before Dawn. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to the director of Before Dawn, Jordan Prince-Wright. Jordan, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, this is, this is an intriguing film set during the Great War, or as we now call it, World War I. Tell me about the background to this, I gather, your first feature film and getting budgets and, and being able to make it in the first place. Yeah, so um, I guess uh, I'd take you back to like the short films that I did and also my last feature film in that um, I use a very unconventional way of getting funding and what I mean by that is that I go to the communities directly. I go to individual businesses and I almost build this network up uh, of people coming on board and supporting. So that's in means of sponsorship or in-kind support. And that can uh, have its benefits and it's also its downsides, uh, in particular the logistics, because, for instance, like, yes, we had $900,000 worth of earthworks, but that was being done on every weekend in between other work because it was being sponsored by a business. So, um yeah, it is a logistical nightmare, but the benefit of it is that when I'm producing and when I'm making this, I really feel like I've got an army behind me because it's not just myself and the awesome team of the cast and crew, but it's also the incredible communities and the businesses across Australia that have come on board to tell this story and to tell what I truly believe is a remarkable story that needed to be told. Yes. Now, it's based on the diaries of soldiers uh, I read uh, from uh, World War One. Tell me about working with uh, Jared Russell, who's credited as the screenwriter, yeah. uh, to uh, to fashion the uh, the story. So I think um, one thing that uh, people sometimes forget is how young we actually were. So I was 15 when I read the diaries. Oh. And that was when I first read them. And that's when I said, yeah, okay, I need, to, I need to make this. And one of the driving story reasons for that is because I'd go and see people and I'd go, oh, and I'd talk about World War I and they'd go, Gallipoli, Gallipoli, Gallipoli. And I'm going, well, yes, Gallipoli is the bloodiest battle, but there's three and a half years after Gallipoli and there was a lack of awareness, if I should say. Uh, people weren't aware of various battles like Hindenburg Line, um, the Somme, Polygon Wood, Hin uh, Mezins Ridge, etc. So that was always the driving force. I wanted to do it. So each short film and then the last feature film, The Western, has built up to this. And Jared and I, we met at, at uni and we started putting this together and it was one of those passion projects for us that grew very quickly. And what was actually really hard about this script is that you've got it straight out of the diary. So it's a very raw. So most films you want to have that typical hero that goes through everything, but it's like, well, we can either please the masses or we can please the critics or what do we do to where do we sit? We have to kind of try and find that balance. And, and look, it was hard. And we're talking about, we were like 19 when we started writing this. So to find that balance was, was tricky, especially from, I guess, our perspective, because we hadn't been in the industry for 20, 30 years writing. So being able to go through that process, um, I look back on it now and I go, I'll probably change this, I'll change that, et cetera. But looking at those diaries as well and seeing those events, we originally had like a three and a half hour script and then we had to cut it back and cut it back because what do you cut back? Every event that you read was so incredible, everything about it. And so how do we get this together? And that was a really hard aspect of it is taking all these diaries and amalgamating them into a hundred minute uh, feature film script. Well, interesting you did that because uh, the, the film focuses on Levi Miller's character who's a, a, a sheep farmer or he's a son of a sheep farmer who decides to go off to war. Um, so telling that story, which is such an emblematic story about young men who went to fight in World War One, went to France and, and so many died, it, I can imagine that uh, writing the screenplay was quite a challenge. Yeah, it was a challenge and it was a, a quite an emotional challenge too because there were parts of it and look, I, I know I already mentioned it, but I'll take go, take back to when I was saying before when I was 15, like there were 15 and 16 year olds that went to war mm -hmm. and you would read it apart and you would say, this has happened today, we had this battle and next minute somebody who I'd been reading about, they'd say so-and-so has just, just been shot. Um, died, you know, killed in action. And then two seconds later, they're talking about what they're eating for breakfast. And you go, well, hang on a second. The last 10 pages of this diary that I've just read is all about him and his mates. Suddenly his mates gone like that. And it's just then continued on as if that mate that didn't exist. So 
it, like I said, they were really raw and we really wanted to capture that rawness without having that glossy Hollywood aspect. And, and so being able to do that was, was tricky. And yeah. And so going through all those diaries was very emotional and then writing the script was emotional, but what is rewarding is that people are now coming out of the cinema and they're going through that same emotional journey that Jared and I went on. And in fact, the last, the premiere that we had, which we had about 1500 people rock up, um, audiences were coming out and, and one after the other coming up and they were in tears. And then these ladies were coming up in tears and these men were in tears and I'm going, Oh no, what have I done? What have I done wrong? Um, but then I realized, and they were, as they were talking to me, no, it's because that now there is that awareness and they were taken on that emotional journey. And I just had to remember, well, four or five years ago when Jared and I were writing it, we were going through that exactly the same thing. And it was hard to write because something could be so brutal. Something could be really good for the story, but what do you keep in? What do you take out? Um, mm. whilst above all doing story and making sure that we're doing, our, you know, uh, making sure that the Anzacs are proud and we're doing the story justice. And I was wondering as I was watching the film, I mean, you've mentioned Gallipoli and I, I mean, there's so many World War One set films like All Quiet in the Western Front and Journey's End. I mean, there's so mm. many. Were, th were there any influences that both of you had in terms of fashioning the way the film looked? Um, so for me, it was making sure that we were always in the trenches so yes we had massive sets but when we actually started editing i found that the shots outside of the trench that yes showed the scale i really wanted to keep that scale to the end and that was a creative choice and some people may like that some people may not um everyone has their own opinions but i i wanted it that way because i wanted the audience to be in that trench be claustrophobic in there with them feel what they went through the mud the rain you know the sandbags surrounded surrounding everything so um, for us, it was, yeah, there was that aspect, but I grew up watching all the old school Western movies, right? So Yal Brenner, Steve McQueen, John Wayne, I was born in the wrong era, let's put it that way. And, um, and I really like even the old school, you know, the golden era of Hollywood. I mean, my logo, all the symbolism behind that is all old school filmmaking. So being able to have that, that aspect where it was trying not to use CGI as much, as much as possible, we wanted the real real deal uh, effects so that way this film could have a much longer life so it wouldn't be outdated so quickly because of CGI or whatnot. So being able to do that, but also one of my favourite films is Kelly's Heroes and the ensemble cast in that. And I was like, well, this is multiple diaries, multiple characters, and let's take that ensemble cast, old school 80s, 70s, 80s films as well, did it, where it was the ensemble cast of all the different characters. So that way they all overlap and it, it makes it a much more interesting journey. So, yes, we have the centre character, Jim, but really it's about that whole unit. It's about the whole section, sorry to use the correct term. It's about that whole section going through this together and seeing the challenges that they all went through together. So that way when an audience is sitting there, yes, Jim, Collins played by Levi Miller may be the lead, but they may re they may uh, find that they recognise and connect more with Peter Sullivan, who played Archie, or they may connect more with uh, Big Big Tooth, who was played by Tim Franklin, and vice versa. So being able to have that ensemble cast also allowed for a little bit more of uh, opening up the opportunity for audiences to connect with different characters and put themselves in the shoes of that particular soldier during that time as well. Okay, and and you've mentioned yeah. some of the actors, but but uh, talk about casting Levi as well as uh, Travis Jeffrey and Ed Oxenbold and Stephen Peacock and so on, Miles Pollard. You have a really nice cast. Um, how easy was it to get them all together? <laughs> um, <laughs> look, nothing's easy. Um, but uh, to give you an idea, um, for me is I don't I don't like taking no for an answer. So if somebody says no, I'm going to keep calling until they say yes. And then when that, and then they get to a point where they go, fine, I'll do your movie, and then I'll go, great, cool, welcome on board. Here's the contract. Um, yeah, look, the cast were incredible to work with, it, and yes, it was tricky with timings and getting around right. But I, I thought even if we had to push it back by a month or whatever, I didn't care because once I started seeing those headshots, and what I love, like to do is I go, right, this is this character then I'm going to put this actor next to it. And I put all the headshots up on a wall. So then I can really start to see the different looks and how each look is going to play with, with the, within each character as well. So it doesn't, it, all of a sudden it's not like, oh yeah, we've got all the same look on, on, on screen. So 
being able to work with all of them, I mean, Miles was fantastic with his the black humour and the, the humour that he was able to bring to it, that Australian dark humour at times. And then you had the lighter humour that Tim was really uh, good at bringing to his character. But um, Travis, you know, having his journey and what he was going through, Travis was even losing weight through the production to show physically what he was going through. So the cast were really, yeah, really, really good to work with and being able to even, like, for instance, Peter Sullivan, who we're introducing in this, like he's been a standout uh, with audiences, uh, mentioning him as well. And, I mean, he's, you know, he's only my shoulder height and, I mean, he's 20-something 20, 20 now, but he looks, genuinely looks 16 and that's what we wanted. And when we had to postpone because of COVID, I told his mum, he put a block at the top of his bed and the bottom of his bed, he's not allowed to grow, you know. Um, but all of them had such a brilliant presence. And I strongly, strongly believe as a director, if you get your casting right, half of the job's done. And the other half is then pulling out the performances you want. And I feel incredibly humbled and privileged to have worked with everyone. Um, and even the female cast that played the nurses, um, played Jim's mum, the, the sister, being able to work with all of them was, um, yeah, it really, it almost showed you not, it shows you the sacrifice of what the men and women went through, but also other small moments of also what the parents went through and the families went through at home as well. Yes, exactly. Uh, I'm also intrigued because I know the film is shot in uh, Western Australia and mainly in Esperance, which is uh, uh, where most of the trenches were and so on. Tell me about the the special effects, so to speak, um, <laughs> in terms of uh, how you did all of that and, and made it look like it was really in France in World War One. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so we started building uh, back in 2020, I think it was, and with, with the intention to film 2021, but COVID and we had to postpone. Um, and, and, yeah, we because of the 12-month postponement, it actually worked in our favour because then the weather got to those trenches and it naturally started to degrade the trenches and the wood and it was 30 tonnes of wood for the smaller set and the wood would start buckling, which then meant the team would have to come and put another bit of wood there to fix it up. But it, then it really looked the real deal. Um, especially for the Australian trenches, which because they were in lower ground, all the water would run down to there. It was always, they were always having to do that. And where we decided to build it, we built it the same way. So we would build the Australian trenches at the bottom of the hill. So when it did rain, whilst it was a nightmare for the crew while we were filming, the water was all running into the trenches. So it looked, looked great. That's what we wanted. But also logistically, we thought, well, maybe we should have just got some pumps and did it that way because now we've, when it poured down with rain, we were being flooded. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, look, it, and it was really, I mean, look, hats off to um, the farmer that owned the place and even all of uh, his family and even going up to the station up in Kew that we filmed all the outback scene. Uh, those guys really went above and beyond to really support the project. And, yeah, when I first met Mark, who owned the property down there, I said, oh, yeah, I need to film as far as the eye can see this way and that way, et cetera. I said, oh, and by the way, that's for one of the sets. I've got a few others. We also want to build a nurse's station, which was like a 13 metre by nine metre full hut that we wanted to build. And, and I said, oh, we're going to have to like push all this area and we're going to have to re... You know, so there was even roads. We had to build roads so we could get to the set because there was no roads. You would full drive over dirt. And then I'm going, this is where we're building. So now we, we're bringing in tons upon tons of gravel and trucks. We're building roads as well. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of logistics behind it. And, I mean, there's logistics behind every movie, but there's a lot of logistics behind this film that uh, people don't really realise. And mm. I'm looking forward because I've actually made a documentary on the making of this film. So I'm looking forward to when they release that. Excellent stuff. And tell me about the explosions, making it look real. And And I gather you didn't use much CGI at all. No, so I tried. I tried to keep away from the CGI um, as much as possible, and like yeah, like I was saying before, because I really wanted it to feel real. I wanted it so that um, look, it felt real on set. It definitely did. It's the closest thing that we could have got to the real thing. The, diff the only difference was, and one actor said it one day, is the difference is is we're not being shot at, and we get to go home at the end of the day. That was the, the only difference. Um, when the pyro went off. Um, like we would always do a dry run, then we do a pyro run, and it was a bank. They weren't loud, and we all had earplugs, that sort of thing, for the safety. But when the pyro would go off, you'd also look, and at night, because you couldn't necessarily see in the distance, it was just pitch black. So all you could see is where the flares were or where the little bit of lighting was, and it was scary. It generally was. Um, 
so being able to have everything real was it, it added an extra realism for us on set which and also especially the cast which we're hoping and I believe has actually come through on the film itself and uh yeah I mean the barrage like the Hindenburg barrage I remember having a lot of meetings with uh one of the particular sponsors and that was 1.4 million dollars that went up in about 10 or so seconds cool. and that was six months worth of planning surveying having drills come out drilling the area like a team working around the clock getting it all ready and um yeah they did the countdown and of course they pushed the button and as they're pushing the button we're all holding our breath because we're like this is six months worth that's going to go up in 10 seconds we're definitely rolling cameras aren't we <laughs> ah yes i can imagine you would have been through a hell of a lot in as directing this film and uh and making yeah. sure it all worked well so tell me about getting the film out there because i know the film is now on release in australia um uh which is great because it's not always easy to get a film distributed and released and so on tell me about that process so for me um so I we actually support Telethon. Um, so we've got a strong relationship with Telethon. I did with my last film. And then when you go to a distributor and say, hey, I want to release this film, but we can't do the usual way of distributing it. And what I mean by uh, distribution deals, because the cuts, what we need to do between the cuts is that I'm actually doing this film for charity. Most distributors would run away because they're not going to get anything out of it. I sent it off to Umbrella. And I sent it to them and, well, one of our executive producers, Ian, did. He sent it to them and kind of was like, hey, look, this is the film. Um, this is what they're working on. I think it was at a rough cut stage. Um, we'd love to get some feedback. What do you think? And do you have any advice on to who we could send it to that might be interested in it, thinking Umbrella will never be interested in this? You know, it'd be a dream come true if they took it. But I was I, we're like, they're not going to take it. We got an email back with an offer. And it was like, wait, what? Um and yeah, they're like, no, no, we want to get behind this. We love what you're doing. We believe in the story and we believe in what you're doing here and also what's coming up next because they're all about building relationships, which naturally I am. It's the way that I fund the productions with sponsors and communities, et cetera. And, and they said, no, we really want to jump on the back of that because this is a production that we believe is going to go places, but also what is next for you. And, um, yeah, and so they said, no, we'll do an Australian and New Zealand release. So, yeah, as of 4th of April, it's in cinemas. Um, they helped out with the premiere, the advanced screenings, and, like, the numbers have been far beyond that we could have ever hoped for. And, um, yeah, and then Bluefinch Films releasing through all those discussions also picked it up as our sales agent, and it's now got to various distributors because every region's got a different distributor. And they, um, yeah, so it's now going to be in... Uh, it's going to have a release in America. It will have a release all over Europe, um, various places of Asia, so like Japan, China, um, South Korea screening it. Um, funnily enough, uh, South Korea was one of the first uh, international countries that said they wanted it, followed by Germany. So it's, yeah, it's really taken off very quickly in the last few months, and that was based on the fact and the hard work from both Umbrella and Blue Finch. So... Yeah, it's really good to see that they believed in the project, but also believed in us and what I wanted to do with it and also what I wanted to do next as well. Okay. Oh, congratulations on that. That's that's really a fantastic Thank perseverance. You. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Jordan, I'm quite intrigued. What was it, A, that attracted you to filmmaking in the first place and, B, the films that you had made before uh, you made um, Before Dawn? Um, so I made The Decadent and Depraved, which was a Western movie, and won awards in LA and New York, and it went quite, quite big very quickly. It was coined WA's largest independent feature film, and, of course, with Before Dawn, we've well and truly blown that out of the ballpark. Um, but, the yeah, that was really big, and then I made a whole bunch of short films. But uh, the, I guess the film that really kicked things off for me was Not Their Boots, and I made that film. I got flown to Byron Bay. Uh, part of the Young Australian Filmmakers Awards, and I met Jack Thompson, who at the time I was 15, so I'm like, yep, yeah, I know who he is, but I don't really know who he is. You know, I don't realise how big a deal this is that I was meeting him, and he gave me some really great advice and kind of said, you know, um, kind of got, yeah, almost, I guess, that night took me under his wing a little bit and kind of went, this is what you should be doing, look out for this, look out for that. Think more about the business side. Don't think necessarily just about the creative side. And and 
then I've had awesome people like Michael Muntz around it, Miles Pollard, for instance, who's come on this one. I've been really lucky to have industry professionals that have kind of guided me all the way through this, including even the executive producers. And yeah, I, like, I feel incredibly humbled to have that. But um, my first films, I've always made films. And in fact, what got me into films is that I used to watch a lot of old movies. And a lot of the old movies always had a little behind the scenes featurette and they always showed how they did something. And I still remember watching the making of Stagecoach, mm. you know, and again, you know, I'm in my twenties and I'm talking about a stage coach, but I remember as a kid watching that and just going, Oh, it's fascinating. And then watching trail beyond where it was a fake horse, John Wayne sitting on a fake horse and they had two reels and they're rotating the reels, which would what changed the background. And for some reason, that just blew my mind. Like, this is, wow, this is incredible. I want to do that. And I was actually going into customs. That's what I was in high school. I'm like, no, I'm going to go into customs. I can't make films here in Australia. How am I going to make films, et cetera? I got into high school and did a media class. And I was told, no, no, there's a thing called Whopper and ECU that's here in WA. And, and yes, it's all possible. And so I started making films. And then, yeah, that's when I flew over to Byron Bay. And then things just went mad from there so i was actually 13 when i made the decision no i'm going to be a filmmaker and that even means if i have to fly in internationally i will and i've just been very fortunate enough that the following two years then i got to meet jack etc and um what i really really enjoy about uh, being able to make films here is i get to tell australian stories and i want to keep doing that as well because it, it is important you know the the market is always flooded with a lot of um, american europe stories etc and it's like australia we've got such amazing stories here mm. and the rest of the world loves Australian stories. They just do. Um, there's no argument about it. And being able to tell those stories on screen and being able to keep doing it, it's really, it's a dream come true. That is so interesting to hear and what a, what a fascinating background you have. So uh, I gather, Jordan, you're already planning your next film. I am. <laughs> ah, right. <laughs> Got it. Mum's the word. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, look, look, in all fairness what I can say is that it is another true story mm -hmm. um, and it is an epic and um, they actually interviewed me on the night of the documentary crew interviewed me on the night of the premiere and they said oh everyone said that the western was impossible and you went out and you did it and I'm like well Yes, I did it, but I also I did it with an incredible cast and crew around me because you're only as good as the people around you. Yeah. And then there was a World One movie, and they said, what drew you to that? And I said, well, because everybody said it was impossible. And then he's like, oh, okay, so what's next? I said, well, there's this other script, which is an epic, and everyone's saying that's impossible, so let's give that a crack next. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's what we're going to keep doing. Well, congratulations. That sounds terrific. Uh, Jordan, great talking to you. And I just want to ask you a final question. Have you seen any films recently, uh, as in newer films, that have impressed you? That's a, oh, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I mean, look, the last film that I went and saw at the cinema, because look, I've been very busy, as you can imagine, and sure. I used to go to the cinema all the time. Um, I went and saw Top Gun, Maverick. Yep. And I've got a bit of a soft spot for... Tom Cruise, because um, I love the Mission Impossible movies. They're my favourite films. I watch them back to back, love them. But somehow that got him just, whether you like Tom Cruise or not, at the end of the day, he knows how to tell a story and he knows how to take an audience on a journey. And for me, when I sat there and watched Top Gun Maverick, I wasn't a hardcore, diehard fan, Top Gun uh, fans as such. I just went there and and I watched it and went, wow, you know, and the emotions and the certain parts of it was flying through. And I was like, I'm on the edge of my seat, then I'm further back on the seat. And then I'm, you know, feeling all emotional and all that. I'm like, that's what films should do. Films should take audiences, on, take them. Yes, we want that suspension of disbelief, take them out of the real world. But we should be taking them on that emotional journey so that when they walk out of the cinema, they're feeling something. Either that you can hear a pin drop because they're, thinking about what they've just watched or they're crying because they're, they're connected with something that in particular um, or they're coming out extremely excited or happy and um, you know without waffling on too much I also remember going and seeing the remake of Mary Poppins uh, well not the remake the sequel mm. and the credits were coming up and there were all these kids in front and they were all singing the songs and dancing and I'm like and that 
that is what films are about. And yes, at the moment, I'm not necessarily making a family film, but it's that same concept that when you walk out of that cinema, that audience should have had should have gone on that emotional ride so that they're walking out of there going, yeah, you know what? Yes, it was money well spent, but also I'm so glad I saw that because of X, Y, Z. So, yeah. Really interesting to hear all of that. We've been speaking to Jordan Prince-Wright, who is the director of Before Dawn, now screening in Australian cinemas. And, uh, Jordan, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. All the best with your next film. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. No worries. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, Peter. Bye. <laughs>